Harry Cruz, one of the great fiction writers produced by the South, uh, actually from South Georgia, once wrote that nothing is ever lost to memory among a storytelling people. And whether that was on your back porch or your front porch when you were growing up and it was a grandparent or even a great grandparent, or whether that is a more technologically sophisticated medium of sharing stories such as we have today, one thing is constant. That is, we come from a people, black and white, in Alabama, who are storytellers. And so what I want to do today is to make a sort of broad philosophical point that is rooted in the study of history and then three very specific anecdotal stories, not just about Alabama in three critical periods of history, but about my own family in those three periods of history. The broad conceptual idea here is that we have sometimes assumed that what is normal for us is routine, where we can go to the store, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the hairdresser, the barbershop, whenever we want to. And that's true that most of our lives navigate through a pattern, a journey that is normal. But the, what I want to emphasize today is that in almost every generation that I can think of, that I've studied in Alabama history, there has been a crisis. And I don't mean just a casual crisis, just a crisis for a family or a, a particular group of people living in North Alabama or South Alabama. I mean a crisis in the sense that people will not survive that crisis, either physically or perhaps morally or intellectually and be the same people they were when the crisis began. Think, for instance, uh, in Poor But Proud, a story I tell about a family, a very poor family, walking all the way from South Carolina to Calhoun County, Alabama, in the northeastern part of the state uh, where my family lived. And at about the same time, my family lived there. And they write home uh, to relatives in South Carolina about trying to cut down the large hardwood forest so that they could carve out a small farm for the little babies and the older children who came with them walking from South Carolina. And the head of that family, a man writes back, uh, this man in his 30s, to his relatives in South Carolina. And he says, I don't know how life will be for us, but what I know that for any of us who live a little while, life will be better. And the crisis of that family then morphs into the Civil War and then Reconstruction and then the great influenza epidemic of 1918-1919, First World War. Uh, all of that basically uh, explained in the correspondence of that family over a period of nearly a century. So whether it's the journey of discovery or whether it's the Civil War or whether it's the First World War and the influenza epidemic or whether it's the Great Depression or whether it's the Second World War, whether it's the Civil Rights Movement, you can see that for any family that lived in Alabama for any length of time at all, there was a great crisis. And so what I want to do is to tell you briefly about three crises and working from the premise of Harry Cruz, that uh, among the storytelling people, nothing is ever forgotten. And I can't find a second usually where I propose this, but I don't care. I don't need a second. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed are greater than the legal services provided by other lawyers. You found the Backstory Podcast. I'm Harry Still. Backstory Podcast number 119, Wayne Flint's Army. I'm joined today by a partner in crime and client, Mr. Paul Ripp, and in Fairhope. How are you, Mr. Ripp? Very good and fully independent. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Russian, how are things in uh, Houston? Cold, I'm, well, I imagine? they're they're a little chilly and uh 
studying some breaking news right now that's even more chilling. I'll update you all when I get it uh when I get it down to it. All right. So uh we heard a little bit from Dr. Flint. I hope that whets your appetite and I hope you want to go listen to the rest of it because he's a fascinating uh historian and a really smart individual. Um he also wrote a letter this week to the Alabama legislature, and I thought I might share it um, with the Backstory Podcast uh, listening audience. This is a guest opinion column that, uh, penned March 8th, 2022. Dear Alabama legislators, I called the office of my state senator several weeks ago concerning House Bill 312, which proposes to restrict how K-12 through public school educators, and university professors teach about race, gender, and religion. Unfortunately, the message I left to call me back for my input on this debate was never returned, hence to this public response. Having written 13 books about these subjects, having taught Alabama and Southern history as well as other courses to 6,000 students at Sanford and Auburn universities during a 41-year teaching career, having proudly been an ordained Baptist minister for more than 60 years, as well as a Sunday school teacher and having begun my own Bible uh, commentary based on hundreds of times reading the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation, I have several questions for you. How far have you progressed in your study of the Bible? In what scholarly publications or books have you shared your knowledge of race, gender, the Bible, and religion? Which of you have formal credentials to teach even a first-grade course about uh-huh. race, gender, hey. and religion? Much hey, less write legislation for university faculties about these subjects. Since House Bill 312 forbids Alabama teachers from teaching courses of instruction that direct or compel students to adhere or to affirm certain concepts about race, gender, or religion, could you specify where in public schools or universities such compulsion has occurred? Or is this compulsion simply the misplaced passion which Alabama political demagogues masquerading as statesmen experience when launching re-election campaigns? By the way, if Alabama citizens wanted to send their children to state universities that retain accreditation, they might consider sending them out of state. Should such ignorance be installed into law, because I'm reasonably certain that formal action to withdraw academic accreditation from Alabama State University is lurking in the shadows of House Bill 312. Sincerely, Wayne Frent. Flint, Distinguished University Professor Emeritus, Department of History at Auburn University. Amen. Makes Alabama look so good, doesn't it? So this was my history professor who taught me to hate the Alabama Constitution. <laughs> Serious? Yes, he he, huh, he was my professor of history and he taught and he destroyed my world. Well, you know, my thing is this. History is history. Good or bad, it's history. I don't understand how you can compel somebody to teach it in a different manner. I just don't get it. That's not education. That's censorship. Well, I uh, I studied a lot of history in college. I have a double major in history and political science. And uh, I'm here to tell you one of the things that we had to take was a course called Histiography, which was – teaching you how to interpret how people write history. And it was an eye opener for me. And it really taught me that was one of the best courses I ever took. That was at Mississippi state. And uh, one of the things that really taught me was you really got to get down to the five W's when you're studying history, not just current events, but history as well. And uh, the way that, People in a legislature, any legislature, want to sculpt and move history. Every person who studies history knows that that's not effective. And while very possible, it's not effective at all. People always undercover the, uncover the true history. And uh, I think the biggest indictment issued by that letter was that call your Call your local legislator and just quiz them on stuff that you know. 
you know, hey, who's the current Secretary of State of the United States? Who's the uh, what's the Fourteenth Amendment? Uh, anything, just general civics knowledge. I'm almost willing to bet, unless you have somebody like Wayne Flint as your legislature, they're not going to know. They ain't. They, there's not enough mental horsepower to equal Wayne Flint's under that entire Capitol no, dome. Is the problem? Yeah, and and. I mean, I like to. I, so, so I Rains, remember even Rains, as a kid, it doesn't matter if it's if it's Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, California, whoever. Anytime you dictate what teachers can do in the classroom from the state house, it's a horrible idea. Right. Can we agree Absolutely. on that? That's Absolutely. that's all three of us yeah. agreeing. Jesus, man, that's something. It's, <laughs> it's completely unbelievable. So, besides Wayne Flint, the other guy who had a lot to do with my. Uh, uh, influence in my life was uh jimmy buffett who we have uh put on a poster to encourage people to uh register to vote met jimmy buffett in belize central america in the early 80s before he hit it big he used to come down there and play a lot i bet he did the Amber devil's Keith. playground yep so Governor Ivy signs bill to end concealed carry permit requirement, and just let me tell you, um, it's I'm going to get a permit. Of course, it passed seventy to twenty nine, and our local sheriffs say will they will continue to enforce the concealed carry permit uh, through the end of the year when the law changes January first. And of course, all of the sheriffs showed up, and of course, they got a life insurance policy, so to speak. There's going to be $5 million set aside for any sheriff who loses money because of the permitless carry or constitutional carry. Well, that's a good way of fixing a problem. Yeah, you choose your nomenclature. So uh, back to Brookside, Alabama, the black legal black hole for many people. Some, um, are, some are Dale is pretty much the same. Oh, yeah. Um, the dark roots of policing for profit. So the Alabama House passed a bill... And basically what they what Brookside was doing is they went out and just moved their signs down the road so they'd have more highway to patrol or they'd tell people when they pulled them over when they weren't really in Brookside that they were. So this makes it uh, illegal for them to move their jurisdictional boundaries or, or, uh, or move the marker, so to speak. And then, of course, there's uh, Baymanet and Jail Town. Jail Town. Have y'all been by Jail Town lately? No, I know uh, they're busy. I know they're busy constructing their jail so, fortress. So you there. see this this part right here is gone. That's all been de- demoed and uh, all the way over to the docket room, which is behind that building. And uh, we're going to keep. I, I guess it's going to take them a couple of years to do it all. So um, Senator Albritton's gaming bill um, surprisingly has made it out of the Senate and is made headed to the House. Yep. So that's um, interesting. Like I said, I didn't think they had time to get it to the floor, but uh, when the Porch Creek Indians are greasing the skids, I guess anything's possible. Yeah, um, somebody's pushing. So, so um, I got an update this week. One of my a colleague of mine that I went to, a lady, young lady I went to law school with, um, actually went and testified in front of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee last week. There's a companion bill to SB 24. And I can't think of the House bill number, but it's a 300, I think it's 331, um, and that's just for memory. But somewhere in the 330s, um, it, the companion bill in the House is much better than the bill that I've been hawking here, the Senate bill. Um, so anyway, uh, that's probably going to be the bill that gets introduced as opposed to SB 24. But this compels, uh, in child custody cases, parenting plans, which would certainly help uh, alleviate some of the tragedies that occur in our family court system. Um, the elimination of the business privilege tax has moved forward. And uh, some other things that I thought were interesting that I'd like to kick around with you guys. Are y'all, I'm sure you guys know about NFTs and uh, virtual assets, but um, I think it's interesting that, Places like Dubai, which of course is a is a, reigns the largest financial hub in the Middle East, is that is that about right? No, no, no. Uh, Bahrain is the largest financial hub. Well, not geographically, but uh, the overwhelming majority of banking and financing 
gets done in Bahrain. Bahrain is the uh, is the Switzerland of the Middle East. Uh, Dubai is where a lot of wealth is flaunted, and there's a lot of um, projects that are put there, buildings, resorts, airports, racetracks, all sorts of things. So that's all just old that wealth? Are, uh, no, it's actually complex money laundering for <clears throat> international crime syndicates for the most part. Are you eating a but, sandwich uh, or something, dude? Do we need to no. do we need to switch off to Paul for a minute? Let you finish your sandwich? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's basically a Dubai is basically a, a playground for Arabs who want to drink and um, or Muslims who want to drink and for people to flaunt their wealth and launder money through major capital investment projects. So you think virtual assets are just another way for them to launder mm-hmm. money? Sure, okay. sure, absolutely. The virtual. So did you guys hear what the kingdom did yesterday? My yep. God, no, I did not oh, it was hear that. 81, I thought it was 60 people. Holy crap, 81 nope. people. Mass execution. How'd they kill them? Does it really matter? Well, yeah, I was wondering. You know, they, they behead them. Yeah. They behead them? Ew. Yeah, they cut their heads off. So while we're losing folks, I thought we'd count the ones that have been killed by the plague. 79.5 million infected in the U.S. with SARS-CoV-2. With 967,158 deaths. And still people believe it's a farce. Some people. Well, the response was a farce. Oh, okay. So uh, let's do some land yet, Paul. What was in the RIP report this week? <coughs> Pardon me. I hadn't written the RIP report yet. I'm still working on something. We've been working on it all day long. Um their Lanyap had a couple of good articles in there. Sophisticated Froster, that's by um, Gabe Times, Prosecutor White. This is the Pritchard Water Board manager, had a six-figure salary, EBT cards, and yet completely fleeced the thing from one end to the other. Uh, there's four or five people involved with it. God knows how much, how many millions are missing. Four. Uh, four, about four million. That's the guest. Uh, but it, you know, it just reminds me again. What's the difference between this and the executive com- uh, uh, director of the ethics commission fleecing a trust? There's no difference. It's the same type. Absolutely, thing. Absolutely, Paul. Same Absolutely. type That's thing. True. It's just that this was low hanging fruit, and they went after this, and they didn't go after. Uh, I mean, Paul, if you really want to, if you really want to talk about the elephant in the room. There's a big reason why this one got so much investigation and so much touch, and the ethics committee doesn't. A huge reason. Those people are black, Paul. That's oh, I noticed that. <laughs> I noticed yeah, that too. You, you <laughs> take somebody like Baldwin County Sewer Service and a bunch of white guys, fat cats sitting around. Well, not so fat cats. I guess Paget lost a lot of weight, but you had a bunch of white guys sitting around stealing money all day long. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah, same the straw man, the whole straw man series in Lanyap. Those of you that are interested about Baldwin County Sewer, the only sewer uh, utility company in the state of Alabama that's unregulated. That sounds like about as crooked as a damn snake, but you're right. Nothing seems to happen there. The other thing in Lanyap uh, by Scott Johnson could go higher. Gas prices break four dollars locally they're at 420 425 in different areas here i'm betting that they might even get to uh five bucks until the thing starts to stabilize and come back down of course now there's all so a panic about you know we should be doing this with oil and that with oil hey, and Paul, the oil you- pipeline that they canceled where most of the oil in that particular pipeline was for export so i mean it wouldn't have made that much yeah. difference also, in hey, Lanyap me, is let betting me, on it. Hunter let me interrupt Hitter. you for a second. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I saw on AL.com, and I didn't think about throwing it up until now, was that a lot of people have been calling on the Alabama legislature to repeal the gas tax. Yeah, I saw that. That would be right, yeah. disastrous. In a, in a, I, so do you, do you know that one in eight bridges in Alabama is structurally deficient? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, repealing the gas tax would be would not alleviate any problems. It would exacerbate them. Right. It would cause more Then, then one of the things you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you can't, you can't repeal. There's legal without having to go all the way through the 
uh, you, you have mechanisms no, of how it was created. Okay, well, you have no idea. Uh, so, so anyway, there's a there's a there's a house rule that says if you are going to effectuate a, a law that will affect local government revenues, it has to be passed by three fourths majority or something crazy. I'm just yeah, saying it's, it's never going to happen. But there are right. a couple of these idiots out there stumping right now, alleging that it could possibly happen and it couldn't. Well, one thing that I've always held true on gas prices is that whenever gas prices start to go up, anything that you read from anybody on social media, they have absolutely no clue how gas prices work. Right, right. And it just goes to show that the the people being the loudest about it are the people that know the least. Well, I mean, if you took the 30 cent equivalent gas tax off, it would would alleviate the pain at the pump, but then – you're not paying. For, you're not paying to maintain the roads. You're tearing up by driving on. You have no mecha- You have no mechanism to fund your infrastructure. That's cutting off. That's literally cutting off your nose to spite your face. So, Paul, I didn't want to spend too much time on this one, but our circuit clerk is retiring amid personal and professional conflicts. The personal stuff I really don't want to get into. Um, it has to do with her. Somebody who may end up getting youthful offender status, and then the right. uh, the but the the professional problem is that they let somebody out of jail and he got drunk and hit somebody head on and killed them. And they, and they're going, how, how did this happen? Well, it was a paperwork screw up in the clerk's office. Yeah. It was a clerical. Yeah. Yeah. But I find it interesting. Uh, now the article you're talking about in line Yap is now hiring. And that's also by Gabe time Baldwin County clerk retiring amid personal professional conflicts. But the uh, lawsuit that, um, you're speaking about like that also mirrors Baldwin County Sheriff's Department. You know, they're going the wrong way on the highway and they end up killing five people in a car accident and then they want to declare immunity. So we'll have to see where that goes. Uh, Another article by Gabe in there that referred back to the uh, Pritchard um, City Council uh, is now uh, grappling with the loss of water board documents. Go figure. <laughs> That's the first thing that happened. In, so, there was somebody, a big fire. Just yeah, so happened to coincide fire. with the <laughs> FBI showing up two days later. Yeah, or something got wet or something like that, you know. Hey, um, thank God the FBI showed up before they burned them all because we were waiting on uh, DA Rich and, and my opponent to actually show up and do something. Which, right. of course, they did and, not. Um, betting on it. There's two articles in uh, Lanyap this week. Uh, betting on it uh, by Gabe. Uh, All Britain uh, champions the latest on the comprehensive gaming bill. That's what Harry was talking about. Is also the Beltway beat Alabama's nuclear options to the op- to the uh, lottery. Uh, I'm kind of like Harry. I'm surprised that it has gotten as far as it has so far. And, you know, a lot of times I talk about the different things in Lanyap that are unrelated to um, uh, politics. One that I thought was very interesting this week uh, was um, a new program that's taken place in Mobile under sports. And this is a new strength program for people that want to learn a different way of uh, lifting weights for strength, maximizing the strength and everything. It's quite a different program than what has been offered in the past. Let's see. I think he had a phone number in here. He doesn't. But that's at the very end uh, under Hank Aaron Stadium contract nears an end. And read about that in there. That's a very good strength program that's coming up that is offered in the Mobile area. Uh, I've got a lot of advertising in here for what's going on politically, which brings us to uh, Baldwin County, Harry. I'm getting a little bit maybe ahead of you. I don't know. But Steve Carey, who is running against Jonathan Armstrong, and that is for County Commission seat number uh, two, District two, um, is being sponsored by no less than Tucker Dorsey. Any of you that have been around a while can remember Tucker Dorsey and all his shenanigans and the uh, 2010, 2010 election when everything in Baldwin County went sideways, compliments of uh, Tucker Dorsey and 
Chris Elliott, and now we end up with Chris Elliott as a state senator, and it's still going backwards. So uh, if you want to have someone in the county commission that does not represent the good old boys, you're going to have to uh, vote for Matt McKenzie because he is the third candidate for that position and the only candidate that is not Catalyst related. So I encourage everyone to vote for Matt for the simple reason that he's not Catalyst and we just can't continue going down this good old boy uh, road. And then, of course, we have Ukraine, but I think I'll pass the hat to uh, Reigns on that. Well, it's been a absolutely devastating week in the Ukraine. We've had some shifts in Soviet strategy. Uh, one of the things that happened today that you may not have looked a lot, it looked at, is uh, the head, basically the head of the Russian CIA, the Russian Intelligence Service, has been uh, has been fired, and uh, he's probably going to disappear off the face of the earth sometime soon. But um, what we're looking at is, I I sent you a picture earlier and uh, that's from actually last week the stuff that's up there now Um, what we're seeing this week is again this diagram right here what you can't see is the the Dnieper River which flows from Chernobyl and makes an S in the country down into and dumps into the Black Sea right down there near Odessa Um, that little town of Dnipro is Dnieper is the town Dnieper in in, in Ukraine. Uh, what we're seeing, these little faint red lines you can see, are Russian advances. The red is where they control. And you can see that from Sumy and Cherniv, the Russian army has really focused on trying to encircle Kiev. And they're making a lot of progress, but it's going very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. And the Ukrainian defense of Kiev is markedly more than they bargained for. You can see them trying to link up forces from the east of Kharkiv down into the Donbass region at Donetsk. That's the movement you see there. And what you can't see is that the backside of Kiev there, those forces are going to go underneath Kiev to the south because that's where the Dnieper River is. And they're going to cut off Kiev from the through the river. And these forces down here in Kherson are moving north. They're basically trying to push all resistance into the Dnieper River so that every retreating force has its back to the river. All the airstrikes are focused on destroying the bridges and the crossing infrastructure there. And they're basically choking Ukraine very slowly. Imagine it like a headlock where they're trying to put them to sleep. Power out. Water out. Basic rescue infrastructure, out. There's no ambulances. There's no fire trucks. Is there a large amount of civilian deaths? Yes. Is it terrible that they're attacking civilians? Yes. It's a war. Everyone that thinks there aren't going to be civilian casualties knows nothing about war. It is a war, and they are declared war on the Ukrainian people, not just the government. So everyone that says, oh, it's so terrible, we should be doing something more about them... uh, Attacking civilians. Is it, Just remember, is it an understatement it to say that anybody who doesn't run out waving a Russian flag is a combatant in their opinion? Pretty much, yeah. They're going to shell civilian areas. They're going to destroy hospitals. They're going to do all of those things because that's how you fight an effing war. One of the things that Americans don't have is stomach for war or basic understanding of war. Most of our veterans can tell you they know all about it. They see how it's done, and they have a very dark and twisted view of how wars are fought because they're soldiers. They get told what to do, and they see it firsthand, and for the most part, most of them don't get any sort of mental health help with it. And they'll tell you right now, well, yeah, of course they're killing civilians. That's what you have to do in a freaking war. But... Anyway, that's the update this week. Uh, Looking for the encirclement of Kiev. That's going to keep going. They're just battering that city. And that historic city where the summer, the home of the great palace and all of that good stuff, that's going to be rubble before it's all over with. I give it about another two weeks before Kiev falls. Unless they can somehow, the Ukrainian Air Force can 
really knock down and get some air superiority, it's going to go slow, but it's going to go bad. Yeah, well, they're sending in a lot of uh, uh, what's the missile, the tank killer. Um, Stinger. Well, they have the javelins. Sure. The javelin, no, yeah. Stingers, they're, they're... stingers are any aircraft missiles, and they're sending those too. Yeah. And the Ukrainians are doing a great job of knocking air assets out of the sky, but it doesn't affect the air their superiority. They, there's still no fighter pilots up there, you know, making it hard for transport to take place or radar reconnaissance to take place or air air refueling to take place. The, None they, of that's happening because the, the Ukraine's air force has been yeah one of the more out. we can send them all the way. That's what I noticed the other day. It, it was one of the things I noticed the other day is that everybody's talking about okay, we're going to send them all these combat planes. Every time the Ukraine uses loses a plane, they've lost a pilot. So unless right. we're sending pilots with those planes, they're just going to be parked in a hangar somewhere, or they're going to be doing like, what did you see in the end of Independence Day? They're like, anybody knows how to fly? You know, come over here. We'll get the crop dusters and the airline pilots to fly fighter jets. Well, hey, that's I got a I got a nuanced going. question for you. Why does Poland have MIGs? Aren't those manufactured in Russia? Yep. Yeah, because Poland was an Eastern Bloc country until 1991. One. I, I, Those are I, old. That's mix. what I'm trying to say, dude. I mean, yeah. I, I figured they'd have F-16s by now. They, that's part of if they're part of NATO, they can buy. They don't. Them. I'm sure they do have F-16s. Sure, they can, but they don't. They don't need them. No, they don't need them. They have the they have a MiG Air Force. The, the MiG 29 is a fan, the Fulcrum is an absolutely fantastic fighter aircraft. It's it was superior to our F-14. Um, can an F-18 outfly it? Sure. Okay, but can where do I, they get uh, a new wing when the damn wing breaks, Reigns? That's what I'm asking. Well, they, Why would they still be, you know, unless they're just cannibalizing McCoyan, other, other no, aircraft? No, they, they manufacture them. <clears throat> the McCoy and Groovy Edge Aircraft Group, who, who built the MiG, had factories all over the world. And they, they have a factory in Romania. They had another factory in Czechoslovakia and one in Poland. So it's they just manufacture it. They okay, well, you, you answered my question. They're left over from the Soviet era. There you go. Correct. The oh. two things that I find interesting that are going to be uh, really telling in the long run is, uh, first, the immigration and humanitarian crisis that's being caused through Europe with two million people running from Ukraine that's going to destabilize and cause all kinds of problems for several countries uh, in the area that are trying to help and get them in. And then at the same time, this is going to be the first time that uh, we uh, Americans or uh, anyone opposing this war has yielded such um, uh, restrictions on finance and uh, everything on Russia. Russia is really, really gone down the tubes in the last two weeks as far as their financing. Yeah. Now, that has not totally trickled down to the price of sugar in Russia, but it's sure going to be there real soon. So yeah. you're going to see a, I think you're going to see an uprising within the country of Russia, uh, much the same as you did during the um, Vietnam War in the 60s and early 70s. So how this is going to play out, I don't think Putin ever planned on it taking this long. I think he thought he was going to just walk in there. He did not yes. realize, just like we didn't with the Vietnamese, even though we were told not to go to Vietnam. Hell no, we didn't listen. We went. And I think the same thing here. You're going to see a long, protracted battle that's going to cost a lot of lives uh, I do agree with Reigns that uh, the overwhelming military force of the Russians is probably going to quash them in the end, but it looks like it's not going to be easy. So we'll just have to stand by and see. But while you are standing by, just think how well you are blessed living in the United States where you are. So before you start bitching about that gas price being too high, just imagine you were in Ukraine today. Okay, well, when you're the leader of the free world and there's a failure in diplomacy and a and a democratic nation gets invaded, it's kind of oh. it's kind of on you. 
And oh so long game wise, I wonder just how many other little democracies are going to fall that aren't in, under, under some kind of umbrella, uh, you know, a, a defense pact like NATO. Uh, well, certainly. Do, do, that's do you possible think China's going to start absorbing other has... countries? And we, well, we can't. We're going to hand ring. We can't do anything because they have nukes. Oh my goodness, they might use them. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I do. I do. I do see what you're saying there because uh, Putin has also said that these financial sanctions uh, could be tantamount to a uh, uh, act of war. Well, hell, that's him making up the damn rules. Other words, now he's got, now he's being penalized by sanctions, and now he's saying, "Oh well, if you're going to do that, we'll we'll just call that a declaration of war." I mean, you know, that's just. I will say one thing about Putin, and you see it in you see it in Baldwin County. So propaganda machine is so absolutely incredible what people will yep. believe. It is just yep. incredible what they yes, will believe, is. and not. Uh, base it on uh, any type of uh, facts. You so know, just let's watch a, Let's watch a second of Maripol. That corner apartment was a bad idea. That is direct filing, filing on civilians. Reminds me of the Battle of Way City. Yeah, yeah. Wow. No doubt where that came from. The guy in the background is saying they're they're sh- they're shooting from the building. He's talking about the people in the building. Shooting. Right. So they use an incendiary round, or is that just a regular old no, tracer? That's, that's a regular round. Okay, those are Ukrainian Ukrainian home guards. <laughs> They're telling people to get inside and get undercover. Gut shot. Yeah, He's going to die. Can't really, can't really tell what they're saying. Mm, mm. <sighs> okay, they're just they're using some just some medical. It's like watching an episode of Russian ER. There. <laughs> okay, she's okay. There's a translation. Ah, uh, this is just tragic <laughs> pornography. I'm not doing it uh, anymore. Well, the trauma and the terror is, uh, of it is, uh, I think it's compounded tremendously by the fact that the people of Ukraine really did not in their heart of hearts think they were going to be invaded. Same thing they so, said I mean, in Sarajevo. <clears throat> well, I and know, everywhere but I'm else about, this crap they didn't. Down. They didn't believe it and when you have a person that doesn't believe something like that and then it happens, it's far more tragic and trauma than you, than you would normally think. If they're a little bit prepped for it, one thing. Okay. But they really did not believe that Russia was going to do this on an unprovoked attack. Hey, Paul, I know you don't have one, but Reigns and I have, both have a go bag, like a three day bag, yep. a bug out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a three day, I've got a what's called get home bag that's in the car, and I have a whole bug out luggage set. What is that basically? For? And bug out plan, and that's the Alamo. I because of the work, yeah, because of work that I've done in the past, I have certain birds that have avowed that they'll just text me the word bug out, and. If I get it from one any of the four birds that I have, if I get a bug out text message, uh, I'm prepared to leave my home and go to a secure location and be prepared to stay there and indefinitely. And the bug out equipment and s- stores that get I have there. will allow my family to the the family will allow us to get there. And uh, 
that's that's it. I, guess I mean, my... it's 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 the it's the tactical equivalent. It's a tactical equivalent of a hurricane evacuation kit, right? Yeah. And it's basically the same stuff. I mean, if there's a Category Five hurricane that's going to dead come up right up the Houston Ship Channel and dead eye Houston, it's the same stuff. I just take it to a different place. I guess my bug out is three citizenships. <laughs> you got to get there, man. I think that's, 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 that's pretty true. Good. So um, that's true. I want to talk a little bit about my candidacy real quick. Uh, of course, every week I'm going to be showing you a new uh, little section from AL.com, just the crime section, give you some idea of what's going on. So did y'all hear about the guy that shot? He Anyway, he, it was a home invasion. He shot the homeowner. He stole his Jeep keys. Then he went to some community center where he was harassing people. When the police responded there, they said, hey, that's that Jeep we're looking for. So then they chase him down and get in a shootout and kill him. The end. Sounds like a mental case to me. Who knows? Um, well, I mean, if he went from one place like that, and then he went to a community center and did something like that, that doesn't sound like too mentally stable to me. So here's a couple of uh, cases that we've covered in the past. The Coastal Alabama Community College uh, scandal, the utilities explain land transfer to Bowen, uh, I mean, to Baymanette City Attorney, Utility purchases property from trust tied to mayor and lawsuit targeting ethics director will be reassigned to a new judge. Well, now, Harry, that that uh, one about uh, uh, what was it you had there? That, oh, yeah, in uh, jail down there, Bay Manette. Now, those two buildings, those houses, uh, there's something new on that, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I'll get there. So then, okay. uh, so, and those are, those are the, where the, one of the complaints that was the basis of your your uh, writ of mandamus that got uh, dismissed last week against the Ethics Commission. And so uh, this past week, the uh, Baymanette City Council uh, filed a, re- a consent resolution to affirm disposal of NBU property. Lot 1 of the re-subdivision of lots 1 through 9, Lakeview subdivision at Steelwood, 30... To 793 Waterview Drive, and then Lot 12 of the same. And uh, NBU has determined that it said certain personal property is surplus and will be sold using a licensed real estate agent. <laughs> okay. So, wait a minute. Let me get this straight, Harry. Okay, so they buy the property saying look, that they're see, going to use see it. See where the property is and see where Baymanet is? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first thing. Okay, and then the property is supposed to be used as housing for prospective buyers for the mega site, the IDs. right? Right. Correct. Okay, so, so yeah, that was probably so no one ever stayed in the two houses for that reason, and now all of a sudden they're going to sell the two, and they're all tied back to the mayor. They're still in there right now. That's right. Jesus, man. Wake up. I think this is a a great, a great case, a great case of a podcast like this making enough political hay over an issue that they, you know, we can't get them with the ethics commission. We can't ask the attorney general won't do anything about it. The DA won't do anything about it, but we raised enough hell where they're finally going to wash their hands of it and say, God, just get it. It's just not worth it. Right. Having this place on this beautiful golf course on the, on the lake. Right, right. We better get call rid that of this. Win. Yeah, we better get rid of this before somebody really looks at it with authority or something, so we can get rid of it. And as far right. as we, I want people in, in out to in Baldwin County particularly to know that the reason we filed the writ of mandamus is we tried to file complaints or have filed complaints in the past and got no satisfaction with the attorney general ethics commission, judiciary or bar. And so that's why it really spurred us to take the writ of mandamus. Now what we're seeing is that the attorney general uh, was protected by the ethics commission about a year or so ago on his pack to pack transfer of almost six, seven hundred thousand dollars. So now the attorney general is representing the ethics commission and the ethics commission is protecting the attorney general. The attorney general protects the ethics commission and the consumer citizen of Alabama has no, absolutely no chance of getting a complaint filed through um, either one. 
no trans no transparency whatsoever and no accountability. But yet they want to tell you what to teach in school. Yeah, I'll yikes. say this because Harry won't say it because Harry's not politically suave enough to say this. I think. <laughs> Thank you. Despite what polling numbers say. I think that this group divested itself of this property because they are terrified that Harry Still the Third has a shot at becoming the next Attorney General of the state of Alabama. If right. I do, and they I'll better say, start swimming. And, and I'll say this as well, too. Steve Marshall is such a flake and such a poor um, Attorney General that it wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't stumble over his same own feet sometime during this course of this election and give you a real good shot, Harry, because so. he is totally worthless, completely worthless. Well, absolutely, Paul. And our, uh, our fundraising efforts are hoping for a step on your dick moment from Montgomery <laughs> any day now. Any day yeah. now. So uh, some other things that my opponent has done, of course, the redactions of the jailhouse tapes of Paul Hubbard. Um, you can go no to the Alabama political reporter. If you want to see the redacted copies, they're hilarious. Um, I'm going to be on midday mobile, uh, Monday rains, oh, uh, starting oh, good. at 12. I hope you just unleash Finally. on them. Well, Sean Sullivan, I told him to wear an adult diaper, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. People need to be awakened. And just some of my campaign promises. I'm just going to show that every time. And then some pictures of me and my bride to be. And uh, some other stuff about South Alabama. You know, um, one of the things that I haven't had an opportunity. So every time I go somewhere, I tell them a story about corruption that I'm aware of going on right now in their county. Right. So when I went to right. Connecticut County, I told them about. Then I, uh, when I went up to uh, Monroe the other day. And, um, anyway, one of the, one of the things that I, I, I'd like to tell a positive story. And, um, one of the things that I thought about talking about, uh, are two things are the, uh, alligator and the redfish and, uh, well, three things the, and the brown pelican. So range, you can attest to this. I didn't see a brown pelican until I was 12 years old. Well, yeah, there that just was weren't any because of the DD. That was because of the DDT uh, pesticide. We almost lost the brown pelican population, and we were, I believe, in first or second grade when they outlawed DDT because what it did is when it was sprayed over areas where the brown pelican nested, um, it made their, their, their eggs, uh, the shells, wilt. And so there were no new brown pelicans hatching for decades. And they started dying off and there was, they couldn't reproduce because DDT just killed their eggs and they got rid of DDT and thank goodness. Because and now you think, and you'd, uh, you know, in, uh, in Vietnam, they used agent orange. And the only difference there is they used it on uh, foliage and the foliage ended up uh, killing and uh, causing all types of cancers with American veterans. And they denied that there was Agent Orange for years and years. And they're still reclassifying uh, different cancers into that uh, Agent Orange category. Well, and so then the, there's the redfish that was, um, you know, what, it's what we call a slot red now range. You can't keep one under un, under 16, and you can't keep one over, I think it's 32. 30, because 32, the, the yeah. big ones are the breeders, and those are the ones you let right. go. And they ain't worth a damn. You got to clean them with a damn uh, machete. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, this, and I, I don't. I've always been catching release for redfish because the only good thing, good way to eat redfish is in a cuvillon, and that it's too much trouble to make. Man, so I, I've, I'll, I'll eat I've redfish always, anyway. Catch and release them. Oh no, I love redfish. And uh, so anyway, uh, what was other? Oh, the alligator. Man, if you saw an alligator in the Delta when I was a kid, you called everybody you knew. And now there's one on, you know, you can't pull your kayak up without running an alligator off first. Now oh, you got a decent pair of boots made out of them. Yeah, and I've come across that bayway uh, certain times right, if you say you're coming from Mobile, right before you get to uh, that Daphne exit, there's some flats there. And, man, I have seen several alligators out there 10, 12 feet. I yeah. mean, big boys. 
Well, there's a lot of there's a lot that North Alabama could learn from us about how to be how how to have industry and be good stewards of the environment, or at least there are some of us that try to be. Yeah, and part of that good stewards is not covering twelve hundred acres of it with sludge. Well, there's that too. All right. Well, uh, does anybody have any parting thoughts besides get you, uh, cover your, uh, drip your faucets and cover your plants tonight? It's going to be cold. Yeah, I do. I'll say this. Uh, Go ahead. This happened right at the beginning of our podcast, and the news I got was about an hour old. But there was a missile strike in a place called Erbil in Iraq. It's the Ooh. capital of Iraqi Kurdistan. Yeah. The missile strike hit uh, the airport and a couple of other facilities, and the uh, Iranian Defense Ministry has announced that they attacked uh, Israeli intelligence offices because uh, the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, is responsible for the deaths of two Iranian military leaders in the last two weeks. Uh, However, one of those missiles hit the U.S. consulate. So it's a developing story. I don't know a lot's going to come out of it, but I want you to be able to say you heard it here first. And the parting shot I'll leave you with in Baldwin County is that if you are voting for any Catalyst or Scott Boone (laughs) consulting candidates, you are voting against your own quality of life, you're voting for corruption, and you're voting for the good old boys. So find out what party that uh, the people are that are running. Uh, Catalyst has got a stranglehold on um, Baldwin County. And until you break that cycle, we're going to have this type of corruption. We're going to have Baldwin County sewer running amok any way they want. And it's just going to continue. And you're going to hear, you know, that we're last in everything. This is why we're last in everything. We're supporting the good old boys in politics.